As followers of Jesus in the midst of another polarizing election season, we don't have the choice to walk away from our responsibility to change broken policies that are breaking our neighbors or to end relationships with our family and friends who might think differently than we do. That's why this season of the Everyday Peacemaking Podcast is exploring how we are to engage politics as citizens of the kingdom of God and the United States. It's going to be hard and messy, but it's holy work, and we're here for it all. Thanks for joining us for Peace in Politics, becoming everyday peacemakers in and outside of the voting booth. All right, going to be fun. Uh, episode today with Angela Danker, who is someone I've known, I think, five or six years ago. We met at a Red Letter Christians uh, gathering for speakers and writers on Jesus and justice. And uh, she was someone I connected with because she had a fascinating story as one who was like a professional sports writer and journalist and then got uh, captivated by what it could look like to lead in the church and invite people who think differently than each other to connect. And then that informed some of her research uh, about studying the red states and specifically in the wake of Donald Trump's election, how do we understand each other better? And so uh, for me to have her now on this conversation is really exciting, both on knowing the work she's done and then re- like going back through the book again before this episode and saying, wow, this is the stuff we need as we try to close the gap between us and them, or at least just build some understanding and empathy for our political other. I uh, I feel like Angela is the kind of uh, peacemaker that I just love to have a conversation with because, and our listeners will find out in a moment, but she is somebody who is deeply self-aware of her social location. She's deeply self-aware of um, the community where she calls home and the community that she calls church family, like the flock that, that God has given to her to shepherd. She... Um, is also somebody who has done the work of bravery and living into bravery. Um, as somebody who she sa- she even says in, in this conversation, she's an introvert. So she self-identifies as somebody who doesn't always lean into bravery, but this has invited her to be a peacemaker in this way. And I think she just offers a lot for us to think about and to actually embody. So I'm really excited for this conversation. All right. Uh, We are thrilled to have Angela Danker here with us on the Everyday Peacemaking podcast and specifically this season on peace and politics. How do we become everyday peacemakers in and outside of the voting booth? And uh, for you, Angela, you're someone who we've known each other uh, for quite a few years now, connected to Red Letter Christians and their commitment to Jesus and justice and all the different ways that we're working towards that. And for you as someone who has been in journalism as a sports writer and then turned your attention to uh, what in the world, how do, how do we learn from people that might think differently than us, especially around the political arena and your book um, that I'm holding in my hand right now, Red State Christians is awesome and really helps us um, think thoughtfully and critically and empathetically towards those that might think differently than us. So welcome to the podcast and we're thrilled to have you and have this conversation. Um, with that being said, would you share, you know, in the past few years, they've been crazy. They've been unique. Your book is is talking about these years. How have you showed up in the midst of this in your work and in your personal life? And this could could be a, this could function as your introduction, your self-introduction to our audience. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm ordained in the ELCA, the Lutheran Church, um, but I have spent a lot of time, you know, in sort of the evangelical, post-evangelical space. And it's always been really fruitful for me, um, you know, to get out of denominationalism and all the sort of fractional battles that can happen there and sometimes things that feel very um, irrelevant, you know, to most Americans. So I really found a lot of community in those spaces and you know i'm led towards lower church spaces as well so i'm i'm glad to be here and with all of you uh so really i'm really grateful because um as we're recording uh yesterday the new version of my book just came out uh Mm. and i got this unique 
Thank you. Yeah, I got this. Um, I, it wasn't an, an opportunity that I even thought was possible. This book first came out in August of twenty of August of twenty nineteen. And a few years later, you know, I think it was um, early 2021, right after um, we'd just been hit with COVID, the murder of George Floyd, the insurrection. And I'm looking at my book, you know, my book involves, I spent most of the year of 2018 traveling across the country, interviewing Christians in red states and counties, interviewing conservative Christian leaders and attempting to tell like a big picture story of the Christian connection to Trumpism and what happened in 2016. Uh, and, you know, approaching it from a journalistic lens, which is just really looking to have people tell their stories in their own words, lift up unusual voices and voices that weren't being heard in, in mainstream media um, from a pastoral lens and help people understand that, you know, the roots of this movement are theological and how yeah. American Christians view God uh, had a large impact on on their moving into this space of Trumpism, their embrace of authoritarian leadership, and mm. their allegiance to Christian nationalism. Um, and then also this was a personal journey for me. You know, when I'm telling these stories, I know for many of your listeners as well, um, I'm not talking about strangers. You know, I'm talking yeah. about my family. I'm talking about my friends. I'm talking about my church members. I'm talking about you know, people I went to college with. So it was a really personal journey to figure out how do we really live in these spaces. And, you know, it's easy to throw stones <laughs> um, yeah. when you, you know, don't live together. So yeah. anyway, that was that was the initial book. And then um, my publisher had approached me in early 2021 and said, you know, we'd like to re-release the book in fall of 2022 and would like you to add some new content because, you know, between 2019 and 2022, nothing at all happened in the world, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and I really yeah, had... Yeah, pretty you, boring time for us all. Oh, gosh. You know, and it, it, it was each of those things that happened. I mean, COVID, you know, blowing up what it means to be pro-life. Um, mm. The murder of George Floyd really helping me, you know, this happened six miles from my house and really forcing me to look back at the work I did and to find the places where there's racism right there. And I'm sort of tiptoeing around it as I'm talking about this movement. So it gave me the opportunity to talk more explicitly about the role in, of race in Christian nationalism and the, you know, why this movement is so tied to whiteness in America. Um, and then January 6th, just really getting to, to look at the role of explicit violence um, in the midst of this movement. So I'm really grateful to have had that opportunity to sort of re-look at portions of the book. And I, I know for, for both of you and for your listeners, I'm also exhausted. I'm tired. I've been pastoring and parenting through a pandemic. Um, I live in uh, a pretty progressive neighborhood in South, in South Minneapolis. And then I drive an hour west to a very conservative county where my church is located. Um, mm -hmm. So I really live in the midst of both worlds and have relationships on both ends of the political spectrum. And that has been important work and also has been work that has depleted me in many ways. You bet. And I think that's something that we're grateful for to have you on as someone who is living in those worlds. Because I think we're all, as even as we listen in, we, we have, we're experiencing so many binaries and so much polarization. And when it gets closer and closer and closer to home, it becomes, it impacts who, who and how we see ourselves and our community we're part of. And so we need people like you who are not only living in both ways, but you're in both spaces, but you're researching them and can shed some light. And so um, with that, we want to want to point to, we're asking each of our guests two big questions and I'll hand it to Oshita. Um, to bring up the first, but the, the, the first is really how, in, how do we understand engaging politics as a necessary way to work for peace? Um, we have to see engaging policy change as a peacemaking practice on a systemic level. And the other question is, how do we understand that um, on a relational level, we can engage politics, specifically this midterm season with family and friends who think differently than us? We don't just burn every relationship or break every relationship because we think politically uh, in different ways. Hard questions. We want to ask them of you guys. So, Oshita, take us away. <laughs> yeah, Angela, I'm just so encouraged as I listen to you talk because what I hear you doing and what I'm sensing is causing a fair amount of your exhaustion is that you are actively doing the work of peacemaking. 
um, not the work of peacekeeping. So I often think of peacekeeping as just kind of very like anxious, holding on to the status quo, um, not bringing up hard conversations. Um, but peacemaking is that bravery of stepping in and actually talking about the things that make us uncomfortable, actually reaching across. I don't want to use a cliche of the aisle. We'll probably say that a ton of times over this podcast, but like, you know, actually inviting people in and having a relationship with them and learning from them. So um, I'm curious as somebody who's actively doing this peacemaking work, why do you think um, it's important for us to engage in um, politics as a peacemaking practice? How and why? Like, what does that look like for you? Yeah, again, I think um, one of the one of the strongest messages that I feel like I've gotten in my own personal prayer time in my own spiritual life in the last three years has been a call to courage and a call to speak more plainly. Um, so I love that distinction between peacekeeping and peacemaking, um, because I think, you know, white moderates, <laughs> probably such as myself, right? Um, and leaders, even in, in mainline denominations that consider themselves, that want to think of themselves as, well, when it comes to the racism or the problems of the American church, like we're the good guys. And that that's a really problematic frame framing because it, um, it lends itself to peacekeeping. And yeah. I think I've been also drawn to, you know, the book of Amos over the past year, over and over again, where um, we're reminded that, that God doesn't want to see our festivals and that that we're invited to remember that um, that peace can be empty, you know, a call to peace. I think about some of the the calls to peace after George Floyd, and it was it was often a call to silence, a call to delay justice. Um, so I I have really felt you know called to be more courageous as, as a writer and as like an introvert. Um, I think, and it, frankly, like as a woman and maybe as a white woman who has lived a lot of my life in conservative spaces, I have um, chosen many times to be silent in the moment and speak later, or I've chosen many times to to feel that I'm responsible for keeping the peace. Um, and I think I've had to to let go of that it's not my responsibility to keep the peace. It's not my responsibility to keep everyone comfortable um, and I think that work has been, has been really fruitful and important. And I think also, um, I wrote a piece a few years ago because a lot of pastors were getting criticized and the, the, the line is always, you know, you're being too political. So let me know, let me know the next time that a pastor who is advocating for conservative politics in the GOP is called too political because it's, <laughs> yeah. It, it's not a thing. <laughs> so, so as a as a as a writer too, and as someone who you know studies words a lot, I think we have to first unpack what people really mean when they're saying this word political. Huh. Um, yeah. It's yeah. in in spaces that I've existed in in the church, it's really become a euphemism for liberal, um, yeah. or anything except for far right wing politics, right? Because even like. Um, Many of us, like, I don't necessarily self-identify as liberal, but if you're not far over to that right space, um, it's it's considered you're too political, you're too, quote-unquote, liberal. Um, so I think what's important, and I appreciate the work that this podcast is doing, the work your organization is doing, is to create a space for, okay, how does Jesus call us into the political realm? Um, because Jesus was clearly in the political realm. He was crucified <laughs> for the threat he posed yeah. to the political leadership of his day. Um, so how does Jesus call us into the political realm? How do we see politics as an opportunity for solution? Um, I think sometimes I'm helped by seeing the work of government officials when um, they're really and, and lifting up, you know, the positive elements of what government is providing for in our communities. Um, yeah. And because people are so disillusioned, people are so cynical. So am I, you know, mm -hmm. but I think it's important for people to see that collective work together as being a part of the community that we all seek. That's right. So you actually brought up something that makes me think of something you've said before. 
Um, you have a distinction between a theology of glory versus a theology of the cross. And, and so I hear you saying it's important for us to engage and contribute to systemic change. But how do we do that um, in a way that doesn't look like the theology of glory that like many mm. of our far right um, friends um, engage in systemic change? How do we engage in it with the theology of the cross? What does that look like for you? Yeah, thank you for bringing it up. It's my favorite, <laughs> favorite theological framing. I just like, I keep trying to wash the Lutheran off of me and it just won't come off. Uh, <laughs> it sucks. Um, but I think it, it's a good question because ultimately a theology of glory is idolatry. It's putting anything else in the place of God. And I think where, where good-hearted Christians can sometimes run into trouble is we start to see ourselves at, in the role of savior, you know, mm. <laughs> especially mm -hmm. like my white siblings and I. Um, <laughs> and so I think where we can continue to work within the space of the theology of the cross is to understand that what we're doing is what Jesus calls us into. And also that what we're doing, the work on its own is not redemptive. Um, that we have, received our redemption through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And the work that we do together is in response to that, to that redemption. And also just to constantly sort of remember um, who and what we worship and why. And to sort of de, I think that one of the missions of the white American church right now is to de-center ourselves from God's story we have so often placed ourselves at the center of God's story. Yeah. And I think um, Theology of the Cross provides a good framework for moving outside of the center of God's story. Mm -hmm. mm. Isn't that interesting to you that I feel like um, so oftentimes, uh, especially people like myself, white male Christian can write ourselves into the story of God as if we're the protagonists in the story, when reality is those of us in power uh, had more in common with the antagonists in the biblical story. The, like the, the yeah. protagonists were those on the underside of power, those on the margins who were reminding us to pursue a God who would liberate from the shackles of oppression and occupation and of all the systemic garbage that they were tied up with. So it's really a, it, your, your theological framework forces us to do some confessional work to say, where, where am I situated, situated socially mm -hmm. in the United States, uh, especially for myself, again, as a white guy saying, I have more in common with the antagonists than the protagonists in this story. And well, that, that requires some work. Yeah, I mean, that's that's Thurman's Jesus and the, and the Disinherited, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. that's that's really what that's rooted into. So, yeah. 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 And, and uh, I want to ask a question of, of your research in the book, Angela. Um, and But I'll also, it's like when you're talking about theology of glory, and I think it's easy to, to scapegoat extreme right-wing politics and because it's so in our face and pervasive. But I also wonder how many progressive liberals make an idol out of the nation state and their partisan politic as well. And, and I think there's something to be said that this is not just another binary here. This is a, a whole association with how we see ourselves as citizens of the kingdom as part of a modern day nation state called the U.S. This is a this is a message to all of us when we begin to make an idol out of our partisan politic. Um, in your book, you did research on this. Like you helped, you went in to say, okay, who are the folks? You got us close, got us proximate. Who are the folks that voted for Donald Trump in these red states and told stories? Um, so m my question to you is, what did you learn from this project? And how does it apply to this conversation? What does it mean to, how did it help to get proximate maybe to those we don't understand or think differently what, differently than? Uh, what, do we, what, do we, what do we need to hear? Yeah, I mean, I feel so lucky to have gotten to do that work especially after COVID, you know, thinking about all the places I went in one year and then that many of us were in our homes or, you know, very limited spheres of influence and um, limited when it came to travel for years. So that was just, I don't know if I'll ever get another experience like that. Um, mm. So that was really beautiful. And I'm thinking, especially in thinking about the work that you're doing with peacemaking, um, I'm thinking about the chapter that took place in El Paso, Texas, uh, and the work and the research that I did on the U.S.-Mexico border, and also had this incredible gift to be taken across the border into Juarez uh, with a pastor and her family who I was working with in El Paso. And 
that chapter for me, um, I often talked about it in terms of, it reminded me of the, this opportunity that we have when we live together. Um, we see this example in the early church with the way that they celebrated communion and that it was mm. this meal and it was a meal. And even, you know, the apostle Paul had to, had to criticize them for their practice of the meal where they weren't, they were having all those who had enough to eat first. And then those who didn't yeah. have enough to eat came later. Um, so what I saw in El Paso is I met people who were really living in worlds that much of the rest of America thought of as diametrically opposed, you know? Mm -hmm. So I talked with people mm -hmm. who were this pastor who I worked with, you know, he was, he was doing his pastoral education through Liberty university, not because yeah. that was his political alignment, but because Liberty offered a lot of online seminary education right. that was just well known. Um, That's so, right. So he's getting his education there. He's a second generation Mexican immigrant. His father and his brother are US Marines. He has a lot of people in his congregation who are part of the border patrol. He has a lot of dreamers in his congregation. And so he he's managing people, right? He he's ministering to people. And he when I'm asking him about the border issues um, and about immigration, and what he said to me is just, I think. Everybody needs to remember that these are human beings. It's people who are coming across the border. It's people yeah. who are working in the Border Patrol, many of whom are Hispanic um, and are in need of jobs. Uh, yeah. it's, it's people who are dreamers who've been brought to this country at young ages and haven't had the opportunity to have citizenship and have had to live undocumented. Um, and he just saw their humanity first and worked within that space. Um, and I met a lot of people like that. And what was, what was hard for me is some of the people that I met who were most encouraging to me were people of color who'd been employed as leaders of conservatively, like theologically conservative congregations who had been put out there um, on the front, you know, as sort of advertisement <laughs> or had been, you know, used for their skill and their abilities. And what I heard from a lot of them about what happened after 2016 is that they had been valued for what they could do for the church. And then when they tried to share what the 2016 election said to them, they were dismissed and they were ignored. Uh -huh. um, yes. And yeah. that's, that's what we've done um, to Christians of color in America for a long time is said, okay, yeah. we're going to put you out here. But then when you want to share your experience or to lead in a way for justice, then your voice isn't listened to anymore. Um, so that was really heartbreaking. It was this mix of like really encouraging for me to see people with such great ministry work and such commitment to the gospel. And also it was very discouraging to me to see what it had done to them personally, to be in spaces that did not fully recognize their humanity. That's rough. Yeah. 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 I, I, um, as I hear that, um, the theme of proximity seems so significant in all this, that the, the further we get away from each other, um, race, politics, socioeconomic, the, all the borders that divide us, I live right by a border here, um, we begin to lose sight of each other's humanity. And I think mm -hmm. in the political space, that's very much happened. And I just wonder if you, in relation to this idea of proximity, closing the gap between us versus them, it's not that we're neutering our convictions or watering down who we are. It's actually bringing our distinct selves to one another. What did you learn by getting proximate with your political other? Uh, and that leads to our second question, which is, how do we build and maintain relationships with those on the other side of the political aisle that are in our family and friends? Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> I think I've really been educated to in the last few years about the role of discernment in when to put forth your energy in peacemaking spaces and when to know, you know, I keep coming back to that text in Luke 10, which Jesus sends out the disciples, but also tells them when you are not welcome, you need to learn how to shake the dust from your feet and what I see when I talk to my fellow, you know, role pastors, um, when I talk to ministry leaders, is people who had such open hearts for doing this kind of work 
are feeling really, really beat up and exhausted. Yeah. Um, because mm-hmm. sometimes um, there's been a desire. We talk about the value of being proximate and being in community together. And sometimes that has been met with a, a real message of we don't want to be proximate to you. Mm. You are not wanted in this space. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I've had this beautiful experience of getting to a pastor a rural congregation and to build relationships with folks and have learned so much and we've taught each other. Um, and I also had a couple families leave, you know, in a really <laughs> heartbreaking way, actually. Um, one of them, you know, I'd done a lot of pastoral care with the family and I actually didn't find, this is classic passive aggressive Minnesota. Um, <laughs> I actually didn't find that they <laughs> had, I didn't find out that they were leaving the church until I got a voicemail from the Missouri Synod congregation saying like, oh, this family has signed up here. <laughs> oh <laughs> with, <my yeah>. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which I'm sure they, uh, that church, they seem to take a little joy in leaving that voicemail. Oh, um, yeah. But yeah, you know that, and I have had these experiences in my own family as well. Um, And so it's, it's been that work of discernment of how do you care for yourself as a peacemaker? How do you discern who's, who's ready to engage in this work of peacemaking? Because a lot of folks are, um, Mm -hmm. but how do you not get derailed by the ones who aren't? Um, Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's a way to love with detachment. And sometimes those of us who are drawn into ministry, um, we can be prone to a little bit of um, codependence. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think it's important to to cultivate that ability to detach at times, to fill yourself up, to continue this work, because I do think it's, it's very important. I think we're much more likely to succeed in this kind of peacemaking work from different backgrounds, different politics, um, if we do so in places where relationships are already established and not in places where we're, you know, trying to talk to strangers. And I do think yeah. it's it's work and a burden that needs to be borne, especially by white Christians. Um, yeah. But no, it's... it's uh, I, I honestly was much more hopeful for the power of dialogue when I finished Red State Christians. And mm-hmm. now I think we're in, we're in a little bit of a death spiral. Mm-hmm. And um, that's why I just keep leaning into theology of the cross because I'm, you know, I'm convinced that resurrection, that God is working resurrection. But I think we cannot ignore the places where there has been so much death, both yeah. physical, literal death, and also death of, communities and death of the power of truth and death of the spaces for local churches to be places of hope and resurrection. Mm. Right. So Angela, I'm curious because this is a question I often get because I do a lot of work around anti-racism in mostly white spaces. And a lot of the people who interact with me are I, I don't know they would identify as liberal but <clears throat> they would have they would say the part of their story is understanding how deeply tied na- Christian nationalism is tied to whiteness how whiteness is a problem it's there's an inherent violence to it the overt violence excuse me that you spoke about okay so how do you as a white peacemaker sit in conversations with someone who holds different views and it's not just ideological they're saying things that are Mm -hmm. violating the imago dei about another person another human being and so how do you how do you do that do you set boundaries do you tell them like do you correct their language like how do you hold on to that humanity piece um and that empathy and respect for the person you're sitting across the table but also saying like yeah but, but but like these issues really do matter in somebody's lived experience. How do you, how do you do that? Yeah, I think it does come back to um, when you hear somebody dehumanizing another person, um, particularly around race, also around maybe gender, sexuality. Um, I think it is, that's again, something where I've been called to, you know, that is something that you can't remain silent about. And I think often um, if I'm in a conversation like that and I hear something like that, I think about people who are close to me who are black sitting and hearing that, 
you know, and what that would do and, and feeling like I am called to speak, speak in defense of their humanity, you know? Um, so that's, that's what I've been called to do. And I've, um, you know, I, I'm sure there's times when I have still been too silent. I'm sure there's times when I have not. And I think that's that work of repentance and confession and asking God, God promises that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. So I do think everyone needs to have like non-negotiable lines where you say, like, I can't continue in this conversation where you say, um, that's just not okay with me. Um, and you know, I think it's important to know before going into peacemaking conversations, what those lines are for you and to have sort of a way in advance where you're going to respond. So, because in the moment, I know for me, it's like, it's an embodied reaction. I feel sweaty, scared. I feel really powerfully the presence of evil, even if it's from somebody who I love. And, Mm -hmm. um, and I think too, there's that, there's that impetus to just want to calm everybody down. (laughs) Like just, (laughs) you know, because it feels scary if, and that's, that's what this movement, and I'm not going to say individual people, but that's what this movement does is it, it's a, it's a movement of terrorism. It creates terror and, um, and it makes, it makes you just want to bring everything down and calm everything down. But I think more than calming everything down, the role is to say, you know, that is not okay with me. Yeah. That, that makes me, I think of the word courage as I hear you talk, Angela, in this, and in two ways. One, the, the courage we're being invited into to be in those rooms with people who think differently than us, to, to do our best to maintain those relationships and even deepen them where we can with those that think differently. But also, as you use the, the language of discernment, to have the discernment and the conviction to have the courage to say, and that's not okay. Like, we, we cannot allow that kind of language to continue. And so there is, it, there's courage to move towards difference. And if we're going to move towards difference, we also have the courage to stand up for justice in ways that are true to our commitment to follow Jesus. And, and all of that is peacemaking. I think that everyone listening in right now could resonate with that example you just gave of like, okay, my body's tensing up. Mm-hmm. That's, that's either triggering to me or I now feel out of control or overwhelmed. I don't know where yeah. this conversation is going to go that could lead to broken relationship with then then where, how does that impact how I see myself as part of this family or part of this friend group? This is real stuff that's very visceral and embodied. And so yeah. the, how, how we move into it as with courage and as peacemakers is really significant. Right. Right. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I think there's such a, so much of it goes into a place of trust. And we have had like a total collapse of trust in this country, lack of trust in news media, lack of trust in the medical establishment, lack of trust in one another. Um, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. You know, I think some of those reasons are economic and the ways that power and influence even in news organizations has been concentrated. And so there's a lot of reason for this lack of trust. And what that does is it makes people really susceptible to conspiracy theories. It makes people susceptible to people who are outright lying to them in order to make a buck. Um, and so I think in our relationships, there's this I think when you do set those boundaries and, you know, learning about boundaries as a, as a woman and a minister, it's mm. important. Um, when you do set those boundaries and say like, that is not okay with me, it can feel really scary in the moment. And I had some experiences with um, my father-in-law in the summer of 2020 after, after George Floyd's murder and, you know, my outspokenness on it. And he, I had not seen that level of anger from him and it was really, really, not it was it was bad um and you know we went through some rough times around that um and I you know very much felt like being depicted as you know this person who'd taken away their son Mm -hmm. (laughs) with my you know politics or whatever Mm -hmm. um which again um but the end of that story is a tragic and also, uh, I think a spirit filled end in that, um, my husband's oldest brother died of COVID in, um, October of 2021 after 
a long hospitalization. He was on an ECMO machine for months and um, really suffered, physically suffered, yeah. um, just horrendous to experience. He left behind young children. Uh, he left behind his spouse. Um, and, you know, had exist. My husband's family, like many families, were impacted by their politics and how right-wing political figures, how leading Christian figures talked about COVID and talked about the vaccine and, you know, led him, led to him not being vaccinated when he contracted the Delta variant. Um, and so I'd had such of this, again, you know, living out um, the suffering that is wrought by this political movement, that is wrought by mm-hmm. this lack of trust, this lack of adherence to the truth, and really watching the rippling effects of that suffering within my own family. Um, and the end of that story is that um, I was asked by my fa- my family to be the pastor at, at my brother-in-law's bedside when he died. And I was asked to be the pastor who presided over the funeral, um, despite the fact that they generally attend a church that does not ordain women. Um, yeah. And so... You know, I, th- I tell that story because I, at some level, we still trusted each other. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, and somewhere behind all that brokenness and all that anger and all that ugliness, um, you know, there was love and trust in the kind of God who I believed in because that was the God who I was going to lift up in yeah. this funeral service. Um, yeah. So I'm still, you know, unpacking that experience, but I think it speaks to the value of trust, the value of sticking to your truth and God's ability to bring some kind of transformation out of incredible loss and pain. Yeah. So as I've been listening to you, Angela, I've noticed that you said a couple times that you're exhausted and I honor that and I see that. And you also mentioned that we're in a bit of a death spiral. And I really appreciate you also mentioning the complexity of the dialogue, the call to dialogue, uh, and how um, even when you finished your book the first time, you had more hope around that. Um, but I'm curious, so what what would be, I guess, what are the practices or the ways that people have interacted with each other between blue and right that have been most unhelpful as you've seen and have you, as like what has not worked and then what has worked. So what has been helpful in kind of mending the divide? Yeah. I mean, I think social media has been very unhelpful. <laughs> um, it's just, and we've seen, right. Again, like there's such a profit motive behind extreme positions on social media and literally algorithms that drive people to extremist political positions. Um, So I think that has been very unhelpful and people spending a lot of their time and engaging with folks on social media has been really unhelpful. Um, We use Facebook to live stream our church services. So (laughs) I mean, I'm not like (laughs) entirely divested, but um, you know, we have to live in the the world we're given. Um, Also, also unhelpful, I think, is a, again, that posture of, well, we're the ones who are doing it all right. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, sort of thinking, well, those Christians over there, like, they're, you know, so bad. Um, Because again, I think we we can only live in the worlds that we're given. Um, Yeah. And so I think it's, very important to begin with your own work of repentance and confession wherever you are, whoever you are. Um, And also too, you know, as I say that, and as I talk about theology of the cross, you know, sometimes when we're talking about theology of the cross, we're talking to people who are already literally at the foot of the cross. (laughs) And so Mm -hmm. they don't need Mm -hmm. to hear that like God is calling you to suffering. They need to hear that the Mm -hmm. flip side of theology of the cross is liberation and yes. there, yeah. there is a time that we need to preach liberation as well. Um, so practices that have been helpful, um, I think, you know, we're moving into times where we can gather in person again, where we can share meals in person again, where we can physically be together. I just don't think 
I don't think there's a, a substitute for that. Um, no. It's really, and it's embodied. I mean, I think embodied practices are really important because it, it forces us to engage with each other's humanity in a different way. And it forces us to, to take up space. Um, so I think that is really helpful and important. Um, what was the other thing I was thinking about from church? Um, well, I always think for, for pastors and for ministry leaders, it's important to keep things as local as you can. So mm. I sometimes see pastors sort of trying to call out other pastors and saying like, well, if you didn't talk about this political event or this public event, this happening in your sermon, then you have neglected your work as a pastor. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's, you know, important pastors need to hold the newspaper in one hand, the Bible in the other, like pastors need to be aware of what's going on. But I think when it comes to preaching the gospel, you have to be so invested in like whatever your context is and to keep it as local for people as possible. So when I talked about the insurrection to my church community, I had to find a way to, to explain where those elements were manifesting themselves in the county where our church was, you know. So not to just talk in these broad denunciations uh, it's very easy to just say oh yeah you know that's bad or that happened there but that doesn't affect us I mean that's been (laughs) such a hallmark of white American Christianity is like we think we're on this island where things don't affect us um and so I think it's very important to keep a local element too especially if you're preaching prophetically if you're doing prophetic work where you're attempting to call out sin and work for justice to find ways to work in that way locally and to um, connect with local leaders who are already doing that kind of work. Um, there are, you know, I I kept hearing this ridiculous rhetoric after George Floyd was murdered, which was, oh, you know, where have these black ministers and black leaders been when there were, when there was gang violence? And it's like, they were there. <laughs> they were on the street right here. Yeah, They've been doing yep. this work. Where were you? You weren't here. Um, yeah. And so I think it's really important to to not come in and think, well, we've got this plan for peacemaking and we're going to implement it, but to really find out what where the work is already being done and support the people who already have trust and credibility in their communities. And I think that goes for, that goes for rural America too. You know, um, Democrats historically have not always valued the leaders who are already there doing the work in rural America as well. They've sort of dismissed the value of those leaders because they think there's so few of them. You know, a representative from South Dakota told me that they could hold their conference in like a van, a minivan. But nonetheless, (laughs) there are people doing that work and people who already have the credibility locally are the ones who it's important to invest in. Yeah, that's good. It's amazing. Thanks for drilling into that uh, with us, because I know those of us listening are are both um, in need of the frameworks, but also in need of the the practices for those that are trying to live into this tension um, and yeah. to do it with the kind of courage to move towards conflict with tools to heal and transform, but also to see that just moving towards conflict doesn't mean we're apathetic and walking away from justice. Right. Um, so with that being said, Angel, this has been great. Uh, we have two things we'd like to ask you. One, um, how do we follow along with you? What do we need to know about the work you're doing and how does the audience engage beyond this conversation? Yeah, so you can find a lot of resources at AngelaDinger.com. You can find out where to get the book there. It should be available wherever books are sold. And the new edition, again, came out yesterday, Red State Christians, A Journey into White Christian Nationalism and the Wreckage It Leaves Behind, which is much of what we've been talking about um, I do a lot of my, you know, commentary on Twitter. It's Angela underscore Denker, D is in dog, E-N-K-E-R. Um, those are probably the best two ways to get in touch with me. Awesome. Oh, my gosh. Well, I will definitely be following you a little bit more closely. It's um, been a joy to talk to you. Um, so I want to just say thank you because you said something that I feel like um, I have been saying a lot and it's just so good to kind of meet like a kindred spirit around this is that we really need to get really comfortable with seeking local and small change. Um, and I think social media has over exaggerated or made us feel like we have to have more responsibility for mm-hmm. things that are happening hundreds of miles away from us. 
Um, but learning how maybe some of these policies that are are enacted or have been changed, you know, in Washington, how they actually play themselves out in our backyard and then being a part of that systemic change, I think gives a lot of people like a tangible, accessible way to access change that might bring some hope. So thank you for already offering us some hope. But I would love it if you could just close us out with like, what is giving you hope right now? Hmm. As you look at everything, what what makes you think, okay, we're going to, we're going to head in the right direction. We're, we might be okay. Yeah, I think it's, it's kids, you know, hmm. sometimes it's my kids. They're, they're a little crazy, but. Um, <laughs> I maybe- can't relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, um, yeah, you know, their, their willingness though, to, to, to engage in political conversations and to speak really boldly um, mm-hmm. about the need for justice and about their own faith. And also, you know, the kids at my church, um, we have this rural context where p- families are still coming to church with their kids, um, which has kind of taken a hit during the pandemic for a lot of places. But it's such a privilege to be with those kids and to see them um you know, making a commitment to, to learn and to be open to new information. And I even think about my confirmation kids, um, you know, and walking through these last few years with them and talking about some hard stuff. And sometimes I got, you know, phone calls from their parents, um, but the kids were willing to have these conversations and, um, you know, they, they do give me hope. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for being with us, Angela. It was a gift. Hello, Everyday Peacemaking Podcast listeners. There's two things with Global Immersion we wanted to let you know about. First, this podcast would not be happening if it wasn't for our Embers community. This is a collective of folks from all across the country and the world who give money every single month to help fund our everyday peacemaking resources, like our monthly periodical called The Monthly Peace, our daily contemplative contemplative prayers, webinars, and this podcast. So uh, if you'd like to join this community of funders for five bucks a month or 500 bucks a month, we would be thrilled. You can follow the link in the show notes or go to our website, globalimmerse.org to jump in on that. Second, we're about to open up applications for our 2023 leadership cohorts. Uh, These cohorts are designed for faith leaders who want to go on a journey of discovery in the intimate company of peers and trusted guides. We want to do the slow, hard work that leads to healing and renewed vision for who you are and I am and how we will collectively lead restoratively in the church of the future. These cohorts include in-person retreats, online learning, coaching, and immersive experiences. One, uh, the Journey of Hope cohort culminates in a trip to Northern Ireland to learn from uh, other peacemakers in that global context. And the other, uh, Journey Home, culminates with a pilgrimage on the Camino de Santiago where we seek to confront the conflict within ourselves that inhibit our ability to lead towards equity and justice and peace. So space is very limited. Jump on it and you can get more information and apply in the show notes or go to globalimmerse.org dash leaders. Boy, that was uh, a great gift to have Angela with us. And yeah, um, it's rare to find someone who is like, she's all practitioner. I mean, she she lives in an urban setting. She ministers in a rural setting. And she's also, like anyone that's, that's heard her speak or read her book, she's a she's an academic as well. And so she's like a unique fusion of uh, so many gifts that give us a wider perspective on this conversation of peace and politics. So mm-hmm. um, one that was really neat, I, you know, as we're, processing right now I'm just thinking in my own life um what I what I'm taking from the conversation and one one of the things that spoke really loudly she she talked about the she told the story of El Paso and um how different folks some that were very much impacted by broken systems largely the brown community uh Mexican immigrants first and second generation who are now part of the border patrol and they still have relationships on both sides of the the border and both sides of the political ideology and it just kind of it muddied all these things up and she talked about the need for living with dissonance and with discernment mm, yeah and yeah i'm just thinking about that for me as a as a person who's situated in a dominant culture spaces um what are those moments where 
when I'm proximate, when I get close to my political other or I get close to a community on the underside of power I haven't otherwise been exposed to and I'm just learning or being w- woken up to it, how am I living with dissonance? How am I letting the dissonance of that actually shape me and grow me? Like, mm. I, I don't know what to do with this situation. This is breaking my labels. This is breaking my presumptions. And I I need to, I need, actually need to be on my heels and my hands need to be open. And I think that yeah. might create space for the spirit to do some work on me. Honestly, that's what yeah. I was hearing is how often do I get in spaces where I'm not in control and yeah. I am displacing myself such that I feel a dissonance and, and then say, okay, God, show up in this, in this space and, and then to discern what is mine, wh- where do I need to leverage my, my privilege, my platform, my influence for the sake of those in the margins, um, or where in discernment, where do I realize I've gotten too close to power? I need to step away and create boundaries because this is unhealthy or I'm perpetuating a status quo that we, we talked about early in the podcast that like peace can be seen as peacekeeping, which is really just maintaining a status quo, which usually just continues to elevate people like myself. Mm-hmm. And I need to disrupt that. So dissonance and discernment, that was something that popped for me in that conversation. So it's interesting that you say that dissonance and discernment was uh, popped for you because it popped for me, but in a different way. Mm. So like, so for me, the dissonance that I would feel as a person who is on the underside of a lot of these systems um, and who is, I, I a hundred percent love when she's at, like, we ask a lot of people who are sitting at the foot of the cross to like yeah. lean into that, the theology of the cross but the theology of the cross for them is liberation Well, for me, the dissonance to that place of liberation is sitting with someone. um, And I know that this is a specific call for me or some some other, not every person of color needs to enter in this, but sitting with someone whose opinions or whose ideology um, is very different than mine, maybe even offensive and pushing past that place of wanting to vilify them Hmm. or, or and dehumanize them. But the dissonance is to say, even though they're saying things that, deeply offend me I will not offend them in the way that I interact with them I'll hold their belovedness um and so that that's like a that's part of that for Mm -hmm. me is the constant dissonance that I'm like I don't like what you're saying but I love you as a fellow image bearer um but then the discernment of the flip side of that too is the discernment of like but is this an appropriate conversation for me to fully invest in so while I can like love you maybe the most loving thing I can do is say you know what I don't think we're going to agree on this that's right. And not and not feel like I have to continue having that conversation because I can pull away and still nurture love for them. Yep. That if I stayed in, I might I might fuel a fire of rage and yes. and, and and dislike for them. And so that that for me is where that dissonance and discernment piece came That's came good. in. Yep. That makes me think of um Dayud Nasser, he's a Christian Palestinian peacemaker in Palestine and and he very much is on the underside of a bazillion broken systems and in the face of military occupation and violence, their family motto is we refuse to be enemies. And Mm, it's it's what I hear you calling us into like, I'm going to always see your belovedness. It doesn't mean I'm just going to remain in that space, especially if it's toxic for me forever, but it's Mm -hmm. not going to, there's nothing you're going to do. That's going to make me see you as a villain or as an enemy, but in discernment, I need to create space and boundaries, which is something she brought up as well. Like, what does a boundary yeah. conversation look like? Um, like that family reunion is super triggering to me. And so mm-hmm. I need to have a boundary that that's not a space I can go in for a while uh, and not see that as apathy, but as us learning more about what allows us to be in this game, in, in this for the long haul. Um, right. And I think too, uh, yeah, I think that that boundaries create uh, creativity Hmm. Where I think we think, oh, family reunion must mean we have to sit around the barbecue and have Hmm. all these conversations. But maybe that just means a reunion means you go like roller skating. So you're constantly moving and you see and connect with each other, but you don't have those opportunities where things can get heated. So you you preserve the relationship and you leave opportunity for more conversation down the road because you've built what what our what my my and my husband's marriage therapist calls positive sentiment override. You know, like mm. more positive experiences to override the negative experiences. So Yeah, that's good. Who was it that said don't get create don't get even get creative in love? Um Yeah. 
that's yeah. that's a beautiful way to be creative in a very practical way with our <laughs> uncomfortable <laughs> family dynamics. Well, yeah. um, Ashita, you want to guide us uh, into our, our our weekly spiritual practice? Yeah. So um, just in, whenever peacekeeping and peacemaking, whenever I'm able to talk about that, I always talk about peacekeeping as a very like tense and clenched kind of posture. And peacemaking is a very open, expansive posture. And so I wanted to just lead us in a quick um, kind of body prayer. Um, it's called open hands, closed hands. Um, there's lots of different names for it. But I'm gonna, just going to invite us for like, five, like two seconds to just um, allow our bodies to tense up. So tighten your hands up, pull your arms really close in. Just allow your body to feel just a ton of tension. And in this space, just kind of think about all of the yuck and all of the things around this conversation, not the one we just have with Angela, but just the broader political conversation. Like, just allow yourself to think about it and hold it. And then I'm going to invite us to just really pay attention to how our hands feel, our arms feel, our chest, the core. Just acknowledge that tension. And then I'm going to just imagine, invite you to imagine Jesus walking towards you and placing his hands underneath yours, so supporting you in this tension. And imagine yourself hearing Jesus say, let it go. And as you imagine that, slowly allow your body to relax. Open your palms. Lower your arms. Take up an expansive, open posture. And just al allow yourself to imagine that your posture of peacemaking should be like this, fully supported by Jesus, free of that tension, as open and as expansive as possible. Amen. Thank you. Beautiful and necessary. And so, uh, friends, thanks for listening in. We want to point you to our website, globalimmerse.org, also to the show notes where you can download our free PDF practice guide uh, with some very tangible tools to engage in this season, this election season, peace and politics. Um, as in your own life interpersonally, also in relationships interpersonally, and on a systemic level with our votes. So go grab that and continue to follow along in this conversation as the next episode comes. We close uh, with this prayer. May we be peacemakers who move toward difference and injustice with courage as we trust God to guide us on the journey. Go in peace.